Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Sunday morning worship um, at home uh, in Draminas and Red Rock. Hope you're doing well. I uh, hope the past couple of weeks you've been doing okay, um, and that as we move towards the easing of restrictions, and um, that even that would lift your mood, but even more so as we consider Christ this morning, that that um, would give us joy, um, and joy that's irreplaceable by anything else. A couple of announcements for Draminas Red Rock folk. As you maybe heard during the week, um, the executive, the Northern Ireland executive, has announced um, a variety of relaxations of restrictions. One of those includes um, in-person church worship. So we hope, and uh, we I do say hope, um, on Easter Sunday, Sunday the second of April, uh, to be able to meet in Dreminis and Red Rock for Sunday morning worship in person. Confirmation of that, and specifically what plans will be put in place, will be provided next week. Um, but let's give thanks to God for this um, and pray that we would be encouraged by this and helped um, and that we would long to return and worship with renewed joy and hope. This afternoon, or sorry, today, um, Sunday school, uh, there's a video that's going up for primary school children that should be available already this morning and um, from 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. This afternoon, young adults, we're meeting over Zoom at four o'clock, and uh, we're digging into the first or the first letter to the Thessalonian church there in First Thessalonians, and we're thinking about how to stand firm in the gospel, and um, as relevant as ever. And um, so, if you're in lower sixth and above, and um, if you're in college, tech, if you're working, if you're a um, young adult, if you don't consider yourself that old, we would love to have you on. And um, give us a shout. Um, if you want to jump in on that this afternoon. Christiana Explored is also happening this week. The seventh video is hard to believe. We've had seven of these already, or six of these already. Um, the seventh video um, from Rico Tice is going out this evening uh, through the various channels and means that we do that. Um, watch, do watch that, check it out. And on Tuesday night, our special guest for an interview and um, a bit of a chat about what we've heard is Seamus Burke. Um, some of you may know Seamus from uh, from the past. Uh, Seamus is a really, really godly guy um, and has a very interesting story um, of how he responded to the gospel. So I would encourage you to jump on that and also to invite others on with you. and uh, Send them the link too. It would be great to have them on as they hear the gospel. Monday night, uh, men's Bible study. If you're a man in Draminis, um, specifically, we would love to have you on. We're um, it's our final study in our spiritual health check series um, and we're just reflecting on um, what's what we've discussed over the past while um, and seeing um, how we're getting on in the faith. So we'd love to see you. It's at half eight Monday night over Zoom. Uh, do give us a shout if you want the link. As well for both Draminis and Red Rock folks uh, this Wednesday night there is a special midweek um, Zoom at half eight, we have a guest in Philip Annette, who works for CEF, who's come along to share a little bit about the work that he's involved in. So do keep that free if you can and join in. It would be good to see you. Apologies if I've missed any announcements, uh, but they will be circulated as well uh, through WhatsApp groups and the like. But we're not here for announcements, of course. We're here to worship the living God. Although we do it at home, um, in our families or on our own, and we still worship him. Psalm 118 says this, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. When we come to um, Hebrews chapter 13 later, um, the writer quotes from this psalm. He lifts our eyes to God, who's the one who gives us ultimate security, ultimate safekeeping. His safekeeping lasts forever. His steadfast love for his people endures forever as well. His loving kindness does not run dry towards us. And he's shown this most fully in the work of his son, Jesus, who in love lived, died and rose for us. Through him we know God's sure, steadfast love in the gospel. And it's because of him we can lift our voices in glad, joyful, happy praise. Let's do just that in our homes um, as we sing praise to the one whose love is steadfast 
and endures forever. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you. And I will trust in you. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead. my ways in righteousness, and He anoints my head with all, and my cup is thanks to God and song let's come before him in prayer in the name of Jesus let's pray heavenly father we give thanks to you for your steadfast love towards us we thank you that you endure forever and therefore your love endures forever we praise you that you loved us before the foundation of the world before we could do anything you chose us in Christ for salvation and adoption into your family. But Father, we confess that in contrast to your great love, our love is anything but steadfast. We've not loved you. We've not loved our neighbour. We've not done what we should have. We've done what we shouldn't have as well. We've been cold. We've been hard-hearted. 
We've been selfish in so many ways, even this morning. Father, we ask that you forgive us. We ask that you would cleanse us, that you would renew us through the work of your son Jesus on our behalf. But Father, we give thanks that when we confess our sins, your word tells us that when we bring them to light in the light of your grace, that you forgive us, that you cleanse us, you rid us of all our unrighteousness. Thank you for Jesus, who, who is our friend, our brother, our advocate, who speaks on our behalf, who brings us to you clothed in his righteousness, his right standing. We thank you that he brings us into your good presence without fault and with great joy. We pray you'd help us today as we um, worship in our homes. You'd help us listen to your word. He'd help us consider your unchanging love towards us in Christ, our unchanging Saviour. And we help. We ask that you would help us live in that light as we consider what you require of us in your word. And it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. We're not going to have our Bible reading. and We're going to be getting into the last chapter of Hebrews. It's hard to believe and we're there already. Um, but our Bible reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. I encourage you to open your Bibles and read along um, as it's read for us. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who are ill-treated, as if you yourself were suffering. Marriage should be honoured by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we, can fit, we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Now, boys and girls, I wonder where you, whether you've ever looked at a picture of yourself when you're maybe a wee baby or a bit younger than you are at the moment. You see, when Kate and I go to my parents' house, um, mum and dad have these pictures of us when we were smaller um, on a wall and without fail every time we go to leave Kate sees a picture this picture in fact I'll put it up on the screen that she sees this picture and she laughs her head off she thinks it's so funny what I looked like when I was a baby it's not very nice is it and as I said this is the picture we walk past let me ask you a question do I look the same as I did in that picture not really, you'd say. Um, I'm a little bit shorter there. My clothes are different. My cheeks are maybe a little chubbier in that picture. My hair is different. My face has changed a bit. But boys and girls, I'm still the same person. I'm still Daniel. That's Daniel in the picture and this is Daniel in the video. But I have changed. I look different. I act differently now than what I did before. You see, boys and girls, we all change physically. Our bodies change as we get older. But, you know, it's good that we change. Otherwise, we would still be doing the same things all the time. We would never grow to be adults. We would never grow up and get to do stuff adults get to do. Boys and girls, God wants us to change too. It's not our bodies he's talking about. He wants us to grow as people who trust in Jesus. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is when we hear the good news of Jesus, which we call the gospel, and we realise that we've sinned, oh, that's all the ways we've said no to God, when we realise that we need to be forgiven, God is willing and loves to forgive us of our sin. Jesus died in our place for our sin. He took on all the things that we have done that haven't pleased God. He bore God's punishment and for those who trust in Jesus as their saviour and their king. God wants us to come to him for forgiveness, but 
That's not the end of the story. He wants us to grow in love for him. He wants us to grow in love for his word, in love for other people, and in love, in a love to obey him. God doesn't want us just to say, sorry for our sin, be forgiven, and then just go and do the things that we did before. He wants to change us. And you know, he changes us when he gives us the help of his Holy Spirit, our friend, our comforter, the Bible calls him. When we trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and helps us live in a way that pleases God. Even when it's hard and even when we still struggle, when we sometimes do the things that we know we shouldn't, God promises his help. And ultimately, what we're growing into is not some super Daniel or you know, a super version of ourselves. No, God promises to help us grow to be more like Jesus. More like his son, the one who perfectly loved God and others. The one who never sinned. He's the most beautiful, awesome one ever. Boys and girls, we, what we look like changes when we get older. We know that. We can't stay the same forever. But God also wants us to change too. He wants us to change to be more like his son Jesus. And you know, he helps us do that. Boys and girls, maybe today we need to say sorry to God for how we've sinned against him. But we also need to trust Jesus for our forgiveness. We also need to pray this week. Maybe you could pray this week and every week that God would help you change to be more like his son Jesus. And you know what the good news is, boys and girls? God loves that. He is pleased to do that in us and through us. We're going to sing... A really important song, a really awesome song, all through history. It tells us of God's unchanging love for his people and as he makes them, he saves them, makes them more like Jesus. <laughs>
we're not going to uh, spend a moment um, praying for others. Um, let's bow our heads, let's pray in our homes as we're led to pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you to pray for others, we thank you for the reminder in your word today to keep on loving each other within the family of faith. We thank you today for brothers and sisters in Christ at Germinus and Red Rock who encourage us and challenge us and for leaders in your church who faithfully teach your word and help us grow in faith. We pray today for all the young people in our two congregations going back to school in the next few days. Help us as we readjust to life in school and help us not to be anxious about tests and results and future plans. Lord, we're especially grateful for Christian teachers. Help them and us to set an example in school life that is a positive witness to the good news of the gospel. We pray too today for the opening up of our churches over the Easter weekend. Keep us safe as plans are made to gather again in person and be at work in people's hearts, prompting them to come back again to worship together. God, we know that it's a privilege to be free to meet in your name in our country and we're reminded to pray for Christians around the world today whose freedoms are constantly restricted. We pray particularly for Christians in countries like Myanmar, Iran and North Korea. Help and protect them today as they gather to pray and read your word. We pray that you would bring change in the leadership in these countries and that Jesus' name can be worshipped freely. Finally, we pray today for places all around the world where COVID-19 is still causing many deaths and for countries where people have little to no access to the vaccine. As we are grateful for all the medicines and medical help we receive, help us to see need all around the world and to be generous in our giving. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Famous last words. There's a catalogue of famous last words if you go searching for them on the internet. Famous people whose last recorded words on this earth and have been taken down, written somewhere, and put up on the internet. Whether all of them are strictly true or not, famous last words can be humorous. Think of Elvis Presley, the old singer. His final words in public at his final concert before he died, he said, I hope it didn't bore you. I don't think Elvis Presley ever bored every, anyone. We also know final last words can be very sad. George Best, uh, one of our nation's famous sporting sons, reported, reportedly wrote on a card beside his deathbed, Don't die like I did. Supposedly his final words. Last words are important. They're often the things that we remember most clearly. The last thing I'll say in, in this video might be the only thing you remember. As we round the corner into the home straight of the book of Hebrews, we see the writer's last words to these beleaguered, under pressure Christians. He's been telling them how Jesus is better than the priests and the sacrifices that they were to rely on before. But he's also turned the corner and now applies it to them. How does that change how they live? How does it then change how we live? Because how we live matters. The good news of what we call the gospel is not just that God, through the work of his son Jesus, has brought forgiveness of sin and all the ways we've rejected God and the ways in which we've lived our own way. It's not that he's just brought about the forgiveness of our sin. It's also that he has granted us new life now with him. He's granted us the ability to know him and enjoy him and live his way as we should. And that's all before we enjoy his never-ending, happy, glorious presence in the new heavens and new earth when we die. We are, as we see in chapter 12, as we thought about a week or two ago, we are in a race, the faith race. We're to throw off the sin that still persists, that weighs us down in this race. We're to fix our eyes on Jesus, keep looking ahead. We're to live lives that endure suffering, but only with God's mighty help. We're to know that we belong to a different kingdom, living under a different king, and that king is Jesus, and we live under his rule now. Our lives are to be different. They're to be marked by a different flavour. We live to the worship of our holy God. So what's the writer of Hebrews' last words then in chapter 13? What's he going to say? 
Well, allow me to summarise the first eight verses that have been read for us that we're looking at today. And I'll summarise it in a phrase. People who trust the unchanging Saviour are to live transformed lives. Our lives are changed as we look to our unchanging Saviour, Jesus. And that occurs in a number of areas. The writer highlights some of these areas for the Hebrew Christians. And in turn, they are to be applied to our lives too. Firstly, our relationships with others. Notice the start of verses 1 to 3. At the first couple of words of each verse. He says, let, do not neglect, remember. The writer is showing us um, why this was written because the Hebrew Christians and our natural response to others, how we treat others, is more often marked by neglect and forgetfulness than anything. The fact is we are more selfish than we dare to imagine. One commentator on this passage and notes that the pressure of suffering can drive the fundamental responsibility of love from us. As the Hebrew Christians face pressure to return to the old system of um, reliance on the priests, on the sacrifices, reliance on their keeping of the law, it was possible that they were neglecting their responsibility to love and love other Christians at that. That's why God in his living and powerful word reminds the Hebrews and us 2,000 years later that even though we suffer, we need to have our eyes lifted off of ourselves to God and then to others. It means that for the Christian, the child of the unchanging saviour, our relationships with others are to be different. Firstly, he points out our relationship to other Christians needs to be different. See verse 1, he says, let brotherly love continue. This was something that the Hebrew Christians were doing well. We saw that earlier in chapter 6 and verse 10. They were serving the saints. It wasn't just any kind of love that they were showing either. It was brotherly love. Their love for fellow Christians was of a different flavour. Or flavour. It was marked by a real understanding that they weren't just strangers. They were in fact family. Brothers and sisters. Adopted siblings. If you belong to Christ. If you're trusting in him. You are adopted. That's how the Bible describes part of your salvation, of God's rescue from your and mine sin and way waywardness. We've been forgiven through Jesus' cross work, but we've also been adopted. It's as if we are orphans brought in from the cold, from the outside, to God's family. This is a family that we didn't know before, a family we didn't choose, a family we didn't deserve to join at that. And God, the Father, becomes our father and he adopts us into his family. It's this crucial understanding that we are family that marks how we care for each other. We know that in our biological families we would do anything to protect, provide and care and for our own flesh and blood. Well, The writer of Hebrews reminds these Christians and us that actually we have a different and bigger family that we are also bound to care for too. Even if our experience of family has been marked by heartache, sadness, whether that's biological family or church family, we're still bound to love and care for each other. We're to show brotherly love. When we come to Christ, it's not a case of it's just me and God and that's what matters. But it's God, me, Jim, Alice, Patrick, whoever. As tough as our experiences and relationships within a church family can be, and it is difficult, you don't need to tell me you don't need me to tell you that. It's actually part of God's kindness towards us. He gives us to each other. He's that good to us. He provides the lonely with a family, the spiritual orphan with brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and grandparents in the faith. People of the unchanging Saviour are also transformed in their relationship to strangers. See, verse 2, we're directed to show hospitality to strangers. Hospitality is that welcome for the lonely and the needy. Not only are we to display brotherly love to Christians we know, but in the immediate context, to Christians we don't know. Of course, this is to extend to non-believers as well. But in the immediate context, he's seemingly referring to other Christians that are strangers to us. 
And the, justica- the justification for this is interesting, isn't it? Um, in verse 2, he says, For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now, what on earth is he going on about here? He's not saying that we um, entertain angels when we show hospitality to strangers. He's actually reminding them of an episode way back in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 18 and 19 where Abraham entertains the Lord himself and two messengers, but he didn't know it at the time. So why does the writer mention this? What relevance does this have? Well, he shows us that as we extend hospitality in a seemingly insignificant way to people we don't know, we may be surprised at the spiritual fruit that comes of it. The role it can play for the glory of God it has a surprisingly glorious purpose and joy. One commentator points out that the very people we welcome are not unimportant. But when they're fellow believers, certainly they are destined to serve as priests and kings in the very presence of God. They are those who are being prepared for that glorious moment. That puts a twist on a simple cuppa or a chat in the garden or whenever you can have someone into your kitchen. Those moments can have lasting significance. You never know what might happen. Hospitality and welcome to the stranger is a priority for the believer and can have far-reaching consequences that we could never have imagined. We're also to relate differently to those who are mistreated, not just other Christians, not just strangers, but also the mistreated. Verse 3, remember those who are in prison, those who are mistreated. The Hebrew Christians were to remember them, to remember those who suffer unjust treatment as well. They are to remember them as those... As though, it, as though they were in prison with them. In a very real way, they were to suffer with them. Remember, they're part of a family. They belong to Christ's body, the church. They're united to each other because of Christ. And that unity we share is so deep. Um, that Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians twelve twenty six. He says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. They were to realise you also are in the body that we can suffer too. It's possible that those people mentioned were suffering on account of their faith in Christ as they refused to go back to the old ways of Judaism from which they came. It's an entire possibility for any of us who claim the name of Christ. They and we are reminded that we need to remember those people who are mistreated and in prison. We know of organisations, for example, such as Open Doors, and they report that fellow Christians are being harassed, persecuted, beaten, imprisoned, and even killed on account of holding fast to the gospel. We forget, don't we? Our relative comfort and ease can blind us to the day-by-day reality of our brothers and sisters across the world. So how we relate to them, and those closer to home who, for whatever reason, are mistreated as well, is to be different from the world around us. We are to care for them, remember them, and probably be more fervent at praying for them. People trusting the unchanging Saviour relate to others in a different way. But not only are we to relate to other Christians in a different way, and relate to strangers and the mistreated, but we also have to think about how differently we understand marriage and, um, and the nature of sex and sexuality um, in comparison to the world around us. And even what we naturally assume. People who trust the unchanging saviour and understand marriage in a different light. See verse 4. Let marriage be held in honour among all. Marriage is to be honoured. Held as a gift from God. Who is the giver of all good gifts. Who is given this for our good. Marriage is not to be seen as a burden. Or a legal contract. Or an assumed cultural value. Or even just the done thing. That's just what you do isn't it? And there was a reason for this reminder. Commentators note that the Hebrew Christians lived in a world not too dissimilar from our own where um, the sexual culture was was quite at odds with the message of the Bible. Freedom and license were, um, were key, were big things. We know that full well. As a response to that, these Christians were to uphold marriage as a good thing, as the only place where... Um, sex can be invo- involved and enjoyed. Notice he says that marriage is to be honoured by all. 
it doesn't mean that everyone should be married or should seek marriage. Whether our experience of marriage has been good or poor, whether we are married or unmarried at the moment, we are still to acknowledge that marriage is a good gift from God. It's not something that we should be ashamed of, nor the boundaries that God has set down in his word. We shouldn't be ashamed of that either. It's something we encourage in those who seek to be married, and we encourage those who are married. Keep going. Keep fighting for your marriage. Keep sacrificing your own desires for the sake of the other. As we honour marriage, we honour and promote what marriage is a picture of. And of course, it's Christ's great love for his people. Marriage, as God intends, is a witness to the world of the gospel. But it's not only what marriage is that we're to uphold, but we're also to uh, demonstrate the faithfulness and exclusivity that marriage involves. We read, let the marriage bed be undefiled. It goes from the general, honour marriage, to let the marriage be undefiled. It goes to specific the specific uh, circumstances of marriage. And why does he use this phrasing? Well, simply put, the phrase marriage bed refers to sexual relations. It's used in the same way in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, where Paul talks about sexual relations. And why should this be sought? What's the reason that we're given in the text? The, the text, surprisingly, is referring to judgment. There's a warning. God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. We know God is perfect love. He welcomes sinners. That's what we've said in the introduction to this very sermon. But he is also perfectly pure. He's holy. He's not like us. He's also just, right in all he does. He will judge the sexually immoral outside of marriage and the adulterous in marriage. Now, of course, we know that God does judge sinners. He, he does bring judgment on people. Um, all have fallen short of his glory. All are worthy of his judgment for sin, including sexual sin. We know that those who never repent and believe in Christ will be judged and found wanting. But what about those who profess faith in Christ? What happens if we sin in this way? What happens if we do what Jesus warned against in the Sermon on the Mount? That even if we look at another person with lustful intent, that means desiring them sexually, making them an object for our sexual pleasure, we commit adultery with them in our hearts. What's God going to do with us then? Is he going to ultimately judge us and remove what Jesus has done for us? Well, no. For those who do trust in Christ... He's already borne the judgment for our sin. It, that includes sexual sin. God wouldn't go back on his word of forgiveness. He's already dealt with our sin. He's already dealt with the sin of those who trust in Jesus. Those who truly belong to Christ will not finally be lost. That's the overwhelming bent of God's word. We are saved by grace. That's God's work in Christ. And we're kept by grace. God's keeping. But I will say it's, it's clear from scripture from what we've just read that it is possible that when we sin grievously in this area and in others that we can experience temporal judgment. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, we know that actions have consequences. For example, we face the immediate consequences of sexual sin. We often hurt others through our sexual sin as well. Sometimes when we fall in this area, when we feel the lust of our heart overwhelming us, we can actually feel God's displeasure. Our hearts may feel hard. Our hearts may be cold towards God. Sin is serious. It does have immediate consequences as well as eternal. God warns us in his word about marriage, about sexuality. He, you know, if we want to use an illustration, sex is a little like glue. Marriage is a little like glue as well. Used in the right way, for the right purposes, it secures, it helps, it functions well as it's meant to. But used in the wrong way, with the wrong intention, and glue creates a sticky mess. It gets everywhere. It requires a lot of cleaning up. Marriage, the union of one man and one woman. Sex within marriage is serious. 
They're precious gifts God gives. They're not dirty things. Even those who profess faith in Christ struggle in this area, whether married or unmarried. Our eyes and our desires can go to places that we never would have imagined. We need to rightly hear the warning here, don't we? We cannot and should not pursue things that are contrary to what God intends, whether we're men or women, whether we're young or old. Whether that's casual sex outside of marriage, whether that's desiring others sexually and when we should not, whether it's seeing others as objects of sexual desire, whether it's watching pornography, whether it's physical adultery within marriage. Let me be clear. The problem is not primarily with other people or things tempting us, as true as that often is. We don't solve this problem by bouncing our eyes away, by being careful about what we watch or consume. That Those things may help, but they won't ultimately solve the problem. Because the primary problem is not with other people, it is with us. It is not the world out there, primarily it is the world in here. Our own hearts desire these things. Please hear me out, God is judge. We must confess our sin to him and those we wrong in this area. We must seek help. We have a family, remember, ready, willing to help us. We have elders, youth leaders, friends we can trust and who we can talk to if this is an area in which we struggle. We must, with his great help, seek to keep the marriage bed undefiled. Clear as mud. We're not clear as mud, it's very clear. We must seek to live lives that are pleasing to God. Let's ask him to change us, however difficult that might be. But I understand and I am confronted with this as well. Many of us feel the weight of past or present failure in this area. Whether we're married now or unmarried or maybe we were married at the time. Maybe we feel as if we can't confess our sin to God because he just doesn't care or he won't listen or he'll just kick us out. Hear me out. God is ready and willing to forgive the repentant. He's ready and willing to forgive those who seek forgiveness. The amazing news of the gospel is that God accepts all kinds of sinners. Jesus bore the weight and punishment of those very same sexual sins and failures on himself. They're removed as far as the east is from the west. You try and put a pinpoint on the east and from the west. There's no part of us he's not willing to cleanse and forgive. Especially the very things we are most ashamed of. We can turn to him and trust him that in Jesus you and I can find rest from sin for our souls. Folks, sin is serious. We're clear on that. But God's grace, which is Jesus himself, is much more powerful. People who trust the unchanging Saviour live transformed lives when it comes to how we treat each other. And when it comes to marriage and sexuality. But we're also to have different attitudes to money and possessions. See verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Loving your brothers and sisters in the faith is to be practised. Loving the stranger is a priority. But loving money is not. Now why is the writer telling the Hebrew Christians this? Well, remember, this is written in the light of suffering, of pressure to go back to what they were before. It's entirely possible these Hebrew Christians were tempted to find security um, in what they could accumulate. It would insulate them from hardship. But the problem with this is that accumulation of stuff can reveal a deeper heart problem. The old reformer John Calvin once said that the heart is an idle factory. Think about a factory, maybe you work in one, maybe you've worked in one in the past. It's always producing all kinds of different products. It never stops. That's what our hearts can be like, can't they? We're always producing idols to worship. We're making idols out of things and people. This is not about not seeking to earn a wage or provide for your family. These are all good and wise things. But this is more referring to the danger of directing our devotions, our desires, our time and effort towards comfort and accumulation of wealth. We've been commanded otherwise. Be content with what you have. This isn't a negative command, but a positive one. Be happy with what you have. Why? Verse 5 and 6 give us a sure indication of where our ultimate eternal security lies. It's found in God himself, on the promises he has made throughout the Old Testament. Their confidence and ours 
is founded on his promise that he will never leave nor forsake. He quotes Joshua 1 in verse 5. In verse 6, God is the helper. We need not fear what man may do to us. Psalm 118 is where he draws this from. If you get some time later, do check it out. Have a read. You'll see that our eternal security is grounded in God's promise to us, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who is the cornerstone, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So our security is ultimately not in money and stuff. God is the one who grants eternal security. His promises give us a sure and better foundation for our lives now and to come. If this morning you realise that the love of money has become an idol, and it can easily, I can testify to that. But somehow it's become an all-consuming passion. Confess that to God. He willingly forgives those who come to him trusting in Jesus, asking for the help of his spirit to change you so that you would treasure him more than stuff. We're transformed in relationships with others, in marriage, in how we see the stuff we have. But we're also to be different in how and who we imitate. Our relationship also changes towards those who lead and teach us and have done so in the past. In verse 7 we're commanded, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Now the word remember here is slightly different to the words used in verse 3 and when it talks about remembering those in prison. This includes the notion of make mention. We are to remember and commend these people to others. We're to speak well of them. This shows the gospel. This shows how, um, how the gospel is not ours only. It reminds us that and the gospel was passed on to us. We didn't make it up. Not only are we to consider what they taught, but we're con- to consider how they lived in the light of what they taught. We're, we read, consider the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. Following what is a good example, as they model following Christ, is the priority. And one commentator puts it this way, we don't follow their personalities. We don't imitate their ministry styles. But we imitate their faith and their faith in action. We can all think of ordinary faithful people in our own lives who we admire and can be thankful for who taught us precious truths of the gospel. As I was preparing the sermon I was profoundly reminded of the youth worker in the church I grew up in who faithfully week by week opened the Bible with us. He taught us truth, he showed us how that changed our lives and he lived in the light of the gospel. This man was persistent and he didn't give up if we weren't interested or if we were difficult, which was often. But God used him so greatly in my own conversion at the age of 14. And he used him to ground me in the years that came after that. No person is perfect. There's no such person as a sinless person. There is much in a person that we should not imitate as well. Christ is the one we look to, but we are commended to imitate those who imitate Christ. Whether that's ministers, elders, Sunday school Bible class teachers, youth club leaders, youth fellowship leaders, BB, GB leaders, parents, grandparents, friends, older Christians in church, evangelists, or whoever was and that does preach and explain the gospel to us, we must remember and be thankful for them. God in his kindness has brought these people into our lives So that we would have the gentle correction, the clear presentation of the gospel and have someone who walks with us and persists with us week by week to show us us the glory and the beauty of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the greatest legacy any of us can leave behind. Ordinary, faithful people who serve an extraordinary, faithful saviour. Let's be thankful to God for them. If they're living still, let's thank them personally. Let's ask for God's help to be like that for others. As we faithfully point away from ourselves to the unchanging Saviour. We're reminded in verse 8 here. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. He's the same Lord who saved them and us. Who opened their eyes and ours to the glory, his glory and beauty. And who they and we are to thankfully and humbly serve. Jesus has not changed, his word hasn't changed, nor has his gospel, his commands, his person and mercy. Because Jesus is the same, 
We thank God for those who have faithfully gone before us and we imitate them in their faithful life and witness to the life-changing gospel of Jesus. It has not changed. But as we finish, I could leave it here and we would be left wondering, well, why should I do these things? How can I do these things? Why bother? I'll just fail anyway. Sometimes when we read these closing instructions, especially in these New Testament letters, and when it comes to loving our neighbour or loving other Christians, we can get into a way of thinking that we must do these things to earn God's approval, or that somehow we can accumulate enough stuff to outweigh the bad, sinful stuff we do. If I do this, then God will accept me. But that leads to disaster, doesn't it? We'll never match up to what God requires. No matter how hard we try, we will run ourselves into despair and delusion. So how do we begin? Well, it's by looking, as we're encouraged in verse 8, to the one who is the same yesterday, today and forever. Jesus doesn't change. His love towards his people isn't taken from us if we fail. His mercy, his forgiveness of our sin remains. His work on the cross as he bears the sin of those who trust and rest in him by faith. It's a finished work. It's a complete job. It isn't half done. It's not a condition we must meet. It's finished, unchangingly applied to those who rest in him by faith. The welcome he gives us as strangers to God's family doesn't change either. The fact he's our elder brother in the family who is our, the payment for our sins and knows our suffering doesn't change. Jesus' personal work towards his own doesn't change and we can trust him. Perhaps this morning you still have an understanding that God accepts you on the basis of what you do, what you have done or what you will do. But somehow he's upstairs keeping a score about how you're doing in terms of watching church at the moment or attending church in the past whether you do kind things like love strangers and try to be content and not buy lots of stuff maybe you think it's about your behavior what you say how many times you've sworn this week whether you drink or smoke i plead with you abandon that thinking god welcomes the repentant sinner not the one who thinks they have it all worked out. The one who knows uh, they have nothing to give in return for his kindness is the one he gladly and willingly brings to himself. If that's you this morning, repent. Confess your sin to God. Believe. Fling yourself on Jesus, trusting that what he has done is what is enough for you um, to receive forgiveness and life with God now. If you belong to Christ this morning, Jesus is better than anything else that you could rely on for ongoing forgiveness, for when we inevitably stumble, for ongoing acceptance by God. We don't do these things that we've talked about this morning and for acceptance by God, but we do it from the acceptance he gives us through Jesus. And as we walk in thankful obedience according to what he says in his word, we keep looking Christward. We keep looking to the unchanging one who is both our strength to do and our example of how we do those sins. He demonstrated brotherly love, true hospitality, faithfulness to his bride, the church. He demonstrated holiness, self-giving love as he went to the cross. Folks, we fail and fall often. We are selfish. We change at the drop of a hat. But where we change and fail in the areas we've spoken of this morning, Jesus remains the same. Yesterday, today, forever. He perfectly forgives us. He is perfectly merciful to his repentant people. He's our elder brother. He loved us and gave himself for us. And he's our certain hope of forgiveness in life yesterday, today and forever. People who trust the unchanging saviour live transformed lives. Let's trust this brother. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given us your son Jesus, our elder brother, who is the ransom for us, who is the payment for our sins, but who knows what it is like to be mistreated. He knows what it's like to face temptation, but to never fall to it and we thank you that we have a faithful merciful high priest 
and who understands our weakness, who is gentle towards us, who brings us to you, we who have nothing to bring. We thank you that in him we have acceptance of you. We thank you that you not only forgive us, you save us, but you also change us. And we pray that you would make us more like our elder brother. That you would make us more like Jesus. You would make us more loving. That you would make us more faithful. And that you would make us more thankful for what you have done for us in Christ. We pray that he would be glorified in our lives as your spirit works in us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now we'll sing our final song and let's praise God. First Thessalonians 3, 12 to 13. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen.